on Tuesday. And a one minute paper didn't really involve writing a paper, but it's one of those handful of things I ever picked up of benefit from those teacher sessions that they make us go to, you know. Just enough to, to keep me optimistic that maybe sometime in the future I'll find another interesting thing to pick up. But a one minute paper is where you ask your students, don't take a lot of time to think about it, but give me one thing that you're pretty clear about as far as the topic goes. And then give me one thing that you find the most confusing. And uh, so I did that. We're going to go over that today. And I'm going to answer whatever other questions you have. Um, I will then probably spend a little bit of time talking about, um, I think it's lab five. Because lab five, I provided some objects for you or some classes for you that you can use in your own. Um, so you don't have to worry about the business logic class. You just have to worry about the Android stuff. All right. I believe I have in here my one minute paper from last time. Um, that. And my first question to you collectively, well, my, my first question, oops, I don't want to do that. My first question is for the people that were not here on Tuesday, you are welcome to contribute to the one minute paper. That is, what is one thing that you find very clear and what is one thing that you find confusing? I wasn't here Tuesday. Okay. Excellent. I, I'm, you know what? Why don't you take it from here? I'm going to go. It's a beautiful day. I'm going to go out and get some fresh air. Thanks so much, man. <laughs> okay. It, it, is, it is possible that that's the case. I guess I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, and um, I made sure I posted that because that's what I read because I couldn't figure out how to add. Wh when, when did you post that? Uh, Friday. Whenever I want to find it. Okay. The last thing I was trying to do was create the extra. Right, right. Create an icon. Yeah. For the different resolution images. Right. I'm sure I could have just manually added. Right. I will look that up because that would kind of be nice if that was the case. It would be nice if that was the case. Yeah, they could. Um, because it, from, and from what I read about from a lot of like bloggers is that they, they really feel that it should be something that should be done because of the fact that screen resolution is so far off now. It's crazy. And well. And it's largely a mechanical process, right? I mean, so like as far as that goes, you could theoretically want a different uh, icon or a different image, let's say, on a smaller resolution. You might want, for example, on a higher resolution, you might want a more, uh, a bigger, not, uh, how do I want to say, a, a, um, You want a bigger image when it gets on there. Right, okay. but, but what I'm trying to say is you might want a different image. For example, 
on better screen resolution, you might want the letters, or on a, a worse, worse screen resolution, you might want the abbreviation LCCC. On a bigger screen and with a better resolution, you might write out the whole word, Lorain County Community College. So you could do that, but in many, many cases, all you're doing is resizing those images. And you're resizing them in a very mechanical way. In other words, there's the ratios of the sizes of images. It's not like there's a lot of care. And if you did want to do that, you should be able to override what Android did for you. But I don't know if that's the case. That is something I will have to look up uh, yeah, they, for they you. OK. Okay. Well, I'll look it up. Um, Uh, yeah, I will, I, will, I will look for that. That one I will not have an answer for you today on. Um, in um, Android Studio, okay. Um, the bottom line is even like regardless of that, if it does it for you, you still, it, it still is important to understand sort of that concept. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else that was not here uh, Tuesday that cares to volunteer something that... They're either clear on or fuzzy with. Pardon me? Yeah. Well, I have that once, once a class. I did this in, uh, I think, the Java class. And I had someone says, I, I know it. Well, they didn't say I know everything, but they said, of the stuff that we covered so far, I, I know it all. And it's like, yay, good for you. Here's, here's a question. The first thing I want to do is I want to look at the clear column and see if anyone has any questions about those items. Let me reiterate. The clear things such as how that will point to a view. All right. So code logic, like for example with um, rock, paper, scissors or the dice game or whatever. Most things, well, that's most things. Uh, strings. How you can use the strings file, strings XML file, to get values for hard-coded strings. Again, that's kind of supposed to point to the different elements. And then finally, making the layout. All right. Does anyone have questions over those things? See what I do, and this is diabolical, what I did in a Java class. If anyone does have questions about those things, I make, I make the person who said that they were clear on it explain it to them. Yeah. And that's, that's it. I mean, and all kidding aside, that's actually a good practice because it is, you know, you do learn things by trying to teach to other people. Or try to explain to other people. All right, let's look down on the other list then. Um, where uh, things that people defined as being fuzzy. Let's look at the first item on that list. And that is the generic view. Okay. Uh, let me bring up a code sample. This, the generic view gets to the notion of inheritance. All right. Now, 
Another way of saying inheritance is the phrase specialization. All right. In other words, It sounded like sawing to me. I expected like to see like a hole come through there or something. And uh, <laughs> inheritance. Uh, another word for inheritance is specialization, and that's where you have a class that is simply a more specialized version of another class. All right. It's still a member of the first class, but we can put it in more specialized terms. And when we say it's a member of a class that inherits from another class, we mean it has all the characteristics of the parent class as well as the characteristics of the class it is. For example, the one that people do a lot of times would be animals and birds. All right, Animals and mammals. Animals would be the super class in this case. And birds mammals, fish, reptiles, amphibians, all of those could be said to be subclasses of animals. That is, they inherit from animal. And what does that mean? It means that anything that you can say, to, say about an animal, you can say about a fish, or a mammal, or a reptile, or an amphibian. But, there are some things that you can, there are some more specialized things that you can ask a mammal, or you can ask a fish, or you can ask an amphibian. All right? Another way to look at it is let's say we would have um, employees at Lorraine Community College. All right? That's, that's the example I was thinking about when explaining this. Employees at Lorraine Community College. And I use the word ask. You could ask this uh, an object. You could, you could ask this class. What I really mean is, is there a property or method for it? All right? There's a couple special kinds of employees here at LC. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to arbitrarily, you know, I'm going to make these. Um, they're reasonable, but again, if I was designing a system, I wouldn't necessarily do it this way. But there are staff. And there is faculty. Both faculty and staff are employees here at LC, right? So there's certain things I could ask any employee at LC. What's your name? Every employee has a name. What is your ID number? Every employee has an ID number. Um, what department are you in? Every employee is design, uh, assigned to a, a department. Um, who is your, who's your supervisor? Every employee has a supervisor. And so on down the line. All right? So there's some things I could ask to any employee. All right? Faculty, however, are special employees. There's some things I could ask faculty members that would not make sense if I asked anyone else. For example, what classes are you teaching? All right? Have you entered your grades yet? Have you entered attendance yet? These are all things that if I were to ask, say, an office administrator, or a dean, or someone that works in food service, or anyone else, that statement wouldn't make sense, right? If I were to go up to my dean and ask, have you entered your grades yet? What would the correct answer be? These things are so distracting, but I'm trying to be a pro here and, and, and keep my concentration. Um, the correct answer wouldn't be no, because that implies they need to enter their grades, right? And the correct answer wouldn't be yes, because they haven't entered any grades at all, all right? So the trick there is that's not a valid question to ask to employees that aren't faculty members. So now in object-oriented terms, there would be some methods on employees that all employees would share. Get name. Get employee number. Get department.
It's probably Huffman sabotaging my class. Probably is. Probably in there. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, get supervisor. These are we could ask the employee. So they would be defined in the super class. And I would not have to define them on the staff or the faculty class because these two inherit from this. And when we say it inherits it, it means it gets everything that's declared here for free. You don't have to do anything special. Plus it gets maybe some other stuff. Question. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to pretend that doesn't happen. All right? Because literally any of these examples we could go on for years. My, my, my point is to illustrate certain concepts and not to develop a comprehensive system application for the employees here at LC. Faculty, however, entered grades. That's a question I can only ask faculty. If I ask a staff person, that's not a legal question. All right? There is no answer. Now, you might say, couldn't you just have it where staff people it would say no or, or, or yes, or, or you pick one? No, that's not a good practice uh, to lie about data. All right? Um, because you're always going to run up then with reports that, uh, or, or, or queries or something that's going to show something that is absurd. You know, you're going to have a, a division secretary hunting down someone that works the cash register in the cafeteria asking why you haven't entered your grades yet, right? If you made it no, and if you made it yes, then there's problems as well. So in good RO design, you would only have that method available on the faculty. All right? Now, Another thing, and again, we're not going to spend too much time on OO concepts, is I could override some of these methods. There might be a different way of giving a department if you're a staff member versus if you're faculty. So I could override it on the faculty side, maybe, if I wanted to. Now, there could be a third level. For example, nursing fac uh, faculty. What's something special about Thing, faculty that like wouldn't be true about all faculty. They have patients assigned to them, perhaps. Licensing, absolutely, licensing. So, for example, then get license info might be a on the nursing faculty class, but it wouldn't be on the faculty, and it wouldn't be on the employee. All right? Now, here's a good thing about object-oriented. We can treat a, a, an object is an object, right? If we create an object, if I create a faculty object by doing something like this, faculty F equals new faculty. That creates a faculty object. This faculty F points to a place in memory that contains a faculty object. All right? So in memory, F points to a faculty object. However, I can treat these objects as at any level that I want to. All right? So, I write a method that says calculate paycheck. And an argument to that method could be an employee. Well, can I give that method a faculty member? Yes, because a faculty member is also an employee. All right? Could I give it nursing faculty? Yes, because a nursing faculty is a faculty member, and faculty members are IDs. So in object-oriented programming, you can treat an object like any of the parent objects, any of the superclasses that it falls into. All right? 
Um, we talk about this a lot in the Java class. This is called polymorphism. All right. Polymorphism means many forms. So this one thing you can treat many different ways. All right. And therefore, a function in the financial department, the accounts payable department class that is the paycheck or the check class, paycheck class, let's say, I can give any old employee in there. And I have access to all the methods for that employee, and I get the right version of the method. What I can't do is if I treat this faculty object as a employee, is I can't ask the questions that are specific to a faculty member or a nursing faculty. So, the question becomes, what does this have to do with the original question of view? All these different things that we've talked about are views. We have, there's a view superclass. And I might not get this exact right, but the gist of it's going to be right. Inherited from this is text view. Inherited from the view is image. There might be some extra layers in here, but we don't care about those. Inherited from this is button. Table, table row, all those sorts of things. Now, we can treat any of these views either as a view or we can treat them as a specific view to which they belong. So, in the case of I think what brought this question on in the example we were looking at last time We were looking at the what? We're looking at the favorite Twitter app. I remember the specific method that was in question, it was this one. I have private void make tag GUI. Remember, this is where we inflated the other XML file to make a new view. Now, the new view that we made was a table row. All right. So here's our inflator. 
we inflate that XML file to make a new view. Now, this says view, new tag view. We know that that's actually a table row. How do we know that? Well, this is the XML file. I did, the, I did this example last time, yeah, in studio. So, that thing, that new tag view that we inflate from this layout is a table row. Yet we refer to it as a view. Why do I do that? Why do I only refer to it as a view? Why not refer to it as a table row? Right. Notice that the contrasting line of code is this one, where I make that tag button a button. But this new row, I made a view. This function and this function both return views. All right? The inflator returns a view. The inflator takes that XML, brings it to life, creates a view in memory, a view object. Find view by ID returns a view object. Yet in this case, I'm stuffing that view object in a new tag view, and in this case, I'm stuffing it into a button class, or a button object. Why is the difference? What is the difference? Any thoughts? Not really. Here, here's, here's how I would describe it. This guy up here. We're not doing table row kind of things with it. We're just doing functions. We are calling methods that all the methods that we are accessing on that new tag view, which is a table row, live on this level. So we don't need to treat it, even though, yes, it is a table row. All right? When we inflate that, we're getting a table row. But remember, a table row is also a view. All right? So we're getting a table row. That table row is created in memory. But we only want to call methods that exist on the view level. We don't, want to, we don't really need to treat it like a table row. All right, is, is the bottom line. We only need to do things to it that you can do to any generic view. Now, one second. In this case, we say, give me a view. That's what this does. It gives me a view just like this method gave me a view, but we cast it to a button. Why is that? Because we want to treat that like a button. In this case, it's OK to treat it like a generic view, in this case, we have to treat it like a button. So that's why we simply say view, new tag view, because it really doesn't matter. We could have done the exact same thing. I could have said table row. And cast that as a table row. But we don't need to do that because we're only going to do the things to that view that you can do to a generic view. All right? It's just like in the example I gave before for paychecks printing, for example. You don't need to know the specifics of information that is specific to faculty members. You just need to know stuff that's true about any sort of employee. Yes? So Yeah.
yes, except you're missing one tiny detail, I think. And that is the fact that actually that table row that we're creating doesn't have a text property. It has three other views contained inside it. It has a button, another button, and a checkbox. So we're not setting the text for that view. Oh, that's, that's a table row. Yeah, that's a table row. Oh, so you right. can just set the text. So we're going to put something into it that has text to it. Well, there, yeah, there already is stuff in there that has text to it, and that is these guys down here. The button, the button, and the checkbox. Yeah. Right. What we're bring, yeah. It, the inflate makes a view. All right. That's what that function returns. Just like get view by ID returns a view. In both cases, they return a generic view. It's up to us how we want to treat it. If we only want to call functions that are associated with plain old generic view. We don't have to cast it as a button or cast it as a table row or cast it as whatever. We only have to cast it if we want to do things to it that are specific to the object type that it is. Yes. You had a question? Okay. You can ask and I can tell you if it's relevant or not. If a pop-up window is a view, then it could. But a pop-up window, I don't think, is a view, so it probably can't. But there's other ways, other ways to do it. But yeah. Only XML options. Right. The XML is what's inflated. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. That's correct. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking now. Yes, for example, you're talking about like the rock, paper, scissors? Yeah. yeah. In other words, when you click rock, paper, and scissors, it can do several things. It can play the game, get the results, and then it can go and create a new row and display the results. So that all that can happen within the one button. Yeah. Well, within the one button. Right. I wouldn't think you'd have a button. In this case, I wouldn't think you'd have a button in the table row. I think you'd have a button that you press that would create a table row that just had like a text message saying you won, you lost, you drew, whatever. Exactly. In fact, we'll see that code in a minute. Yes. You mean in the XML or, or in the code? Well, remember, that's not, that's not scrolled up. That's in a different XML file. But yeah, I can... Repeat, please. Yeah, inside the scrollable, there is a table layout with nothing in it. And what we do is, when we inflate it, we create our view by inflating it. So that creates our table. Oh, this should say view because I had changed that. We create our view no matter what it is. We point to the button in that view. Now, to your point, Jesse, we would add the on-click event to, to the over and over again to each button we created. Absolutely, because notice this says find view by ID in the new tag view. So it's not looking everywhere in the screen. It's looking in that new view that we just inflated that consists of the two buttons and the checkbox. We set the text to that button. We set the on-click listener to that button. 
we set the um, listener to the other button, and then we say query table layout add view. All right, that's what goes and takes that new table row that we had and adds it to wherever it went, this table right here. So in a nutshell, remember that Java classes, you can treat them as whatever their class is or any of their super classes. All right? So whether we call this a view or a table row depends on whether we want to just do generic row things to it or we want to do specific to table row things. So that's how I can say view, new tag view, inflate it. Because the inflate always makes a view. And we can always call find view by ID on view. We can always add one view to another view. So we don't have to treat it like a table row for it to work. Whereas with the button, we have to treat those buttons like buttons in order for it to work. Questions about any of this? So that covers this. I'm going to skip around a little bit. And I'm going to open a simple dice game, I think, because I think we can talk code from different classes and also images. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. All right, here is my dice game. Now the question was, first of all, images. Which order do I do it in? Let's start with calling code from different classes. Now, in this example, I have three classes. Each one of these classes is responsible for one thing. And to the degree that you can separate things into the components, oftentimes you'll have applications that are more maintainable, that are um, more scalable, um, more reusable. So in this case, we have the main activity. Now the main activity, what's an activity? An activity is a screen that you set Send, you know, present to the user for the user to do something with. It contains the interface, the user interface, and it also contains code to do processing. Now, in the case of that favorite Twitter search, it did pretty much all the processing was in the, was in the activity. All right? But in the example I'm doing here, I'm actually creating classes to do some of the actual heavy lifting. Because that would allow me to reuse this. So if I was writing a dice game application, I would already have my die object created. I wouldn't have the functionality living in um, a specific activity. I could create a second activity for a second dice game and I could use the same die class. So I would be consistent then. I wouldn't have to write that code and so on. So that's a rationale for doing it, for breaking it out, for separating it. Then you can use that code in more than one places. And again, in this case, we're only dealing with single activity applications. But an application could have multiple activities. You know, think of an activity as a screen that you present to the user where you ask them to do something. So let's say I make my dice game application. 
there's a home page that you go to, a splash screen that comes up that says, do you want to play the high-low game, or do you want to play Yahtzee, or do you want to play craps, or do you want to play whatever other dice games there are? You click that. That brings up a screen where they can play the dice game, or they can play Yahtzee. Each one of those screens that I described is its own activity. So the screen that comes up with the menu is an activity. The screen where they play the high-low game is an activity. The screen with Yahtzee is an activity. It's nice if I don't have to recode the dice on every one of those activities. So I put that out in a class. So, in my main activity here, I'm going to look at the on-click event. This is the on-click event of the button. And what does it do? It simply grabs pointers to the different things that are on the screen. And then it calls the appropriate method on the dice object, or on the game object, to get the result. So, let me actually bring all of this code in because there's more to this code than All right. Way at the start of the activity, where I'm declaring, it, declaring the instance variables, I declare a game object. All right, what is a game object? Uh, it's an instance of the high-low game class. So this code contains everything we need to know about the high-low game. All right? Now, when the button is clicked, what happens? Well, this grabs pointer to the two dice that are on the screen. This grabs the value of the spinner. This grabs the value of the results text box. So all these lines of code are doing is pointing to different things on the screen that we're going to change, right? Or that we're going to use. We're going to use the spinner because we want the user's choice, right? We want to know if they've picked low, high, or seven. We need the two images because, because we want to display the image of the dice. And we want the text view because we want to display the results that you won or you lost. Now notice here though, the determination of whether you won or lost doesn't happen in the on-click event. It doesn't happen in the activity. It happens in the gameplay object. All right. So on my game object, I call the method play and I pass it the value from the spinner. SP get selected item position. What's that going to return? What's that going to give me? The spinner's position. Z in our case 0, 1 or 2. And then 0 means that I picked 2 to 6, 1 means I picked 7, 2 means I picked 8 through 12. So I'm going to call that method and it's in this class what does that method do? The play method it takes the user choice it does its thing it rolls the two dice. It gets the value of the two dice. It determines whether they've won or lost. Excuse me. And then it returns the result. So here's the key thing of this. This game object takes in 
the choice that the user made, either a 0, 1, or 2, and it returns a Boolean. You won or you lost. That's all it does. The details of how you play the game are encoded in here, but the, the view UI doesn't need to know anything about that. To call that method, what do we have to do? We have to declare an object of that type. So that's what this line does. This creates an object of type high low game and it stores it in a variable called game. We can then call methods on that object by saying game dot and the name of the method, in this case play, and we have to give it though the value that we've got that, that this needs, in this case the position of the spinner. This is, and then we have to do something with the result. So we're storing the result in a variable called b1. So we call this method. The dice is rolled. We total up the dice. We look to see what we picked. We determine if we won or lost, or we, turn a we return a true or a false. All the UI no does to need to do now is present the results to the user. All right. So, how does it present the results to the user? Well, if they won, I set the text box for the results to this string. If they lost, I set the test results or the, the, the text box of the results to that string. And then finally, I have methods here called get image on the game which returns the actual name of the image that corresponds to the dice. And I have two of those methods on the game to say, give me the image of dice one, give me the image of dice two. So I take that image, And I use this statement, which actually sets the image in the image view to whatever image I said. Think of the image view as being like a picture frame. All right? A picture frame can hold a lot of different pictures. You have to just say what picture you want to put into it. All right? It's the same thing here. Dice 1 is an image view. All right? So we can change what image actually is shown in that image view by this method. And this is the syntax that we go through to grab the drawable that has a name of whatever name we got from the game object. And all that does is it takes, I think, D and puts the value of the dice after it. So like D1, D2 through D6. So. In this case, what is the UI responsible for? What is the click event responsible for? It's responsible for gathering the input, all right? Getting the value that the user picked from the spin control. Calling the appropriate method on the object. Testing the return value to see if they won or lost. Then asking the object for dice one and dice two, all right? So this is sort of the recipe that you're going to have if you use this sort of structure, like on your rock, paper, scissors. You're going to have an object that has the rules of rock, paper, and scissors. It's going to expect the user's choice. All right? You're going to write a method to play rock, paper, and scissors. Its input is going to be the user's choice, whether they picked rock, paper, or scissors. It's going to contain the code to randomly pick the choice for the computer to go through the logic and determine if it was a one loss or draw and then return some value indicating whether it was a win loss or draw so your user interface can display that however you want to questions on this all right Let's see what else is on the clear and fuzzy.
Someone said tables. And someone said making a pretty layout. Um, pretty layout, that's something that we can look at going forward to do. Because admittedly, most of these layouts are pretty rudimentary. But um, the one layout that we've done so far that probably looks the best of any of them is the tip calculator. So we'll spend a few minutes looking at that because that will help me address the pretty layout issue and the tables issue. All right. So, tip calculator. Let's look at the, you know, for a static table, the pretty layout is going to be achieved by coding the XML correctly. In other words, your code is typically going to be simply placing values in table cells, all right? Which those table cells could be pretty table cells or they could be ugly table cells. Your code doesn't know and doesn't care. That's one of the benefits of modular programming, right? It doesn't care what that interface looks like. The code just knows to put something in the cell that is named 15% tip. And again, regardless of how it's laid out, it's going to put it in there. So, a table layout. You can use a table layout as sort of the main layout for my content view. Remember, every content view has to have some sort of layout. And we've, we've reviewed the linear one, the um, relative one, and the table one. I think that's the three that we re we've reviewed. Some of these attributes like padding, background color, and all that can be used to sort of pretty things up. Now, ideally, a table, and this is similar to HTML, you know, to get a real grid look of a table, you can, uh, um, the easiest way to do it, most straightforward way to do it, will be have the same number of cells in each row. All right? So if I define a table row, easiest way to get a clean grid is to have a certain number of cells in there. However, you don't always have that possibility, right? If there's only two things that belong in a row, what are you going to do? Make up two blanks? That's where the layout span comes in. With the layout span, you can specify that this cell, even though it's one cell, it takes up three columns in my table. So all the rows in this table, for the most part, oh, I'm sorry. All the rows in this table, for the most part, have four elements. So like this has one, two, three, four elements. That's for the, excuse me, that's for the percentage uh, uh, tip. Here's for the total. Four columns. A couple of the rows don't have four columns though. This row, for example, only has two. Well, we defined that this guy takes up three spaces. So that's your four columns. This guy takes up one. This guy spans three spaces. So, pardon me? What does the weight do? Let's look that up.
out weight. Actually, assigns importance value to a view in terms of how much space it should occupy. A larger weight value allows it to expand any of the remaining spaces. Oh, it is layout weight. I was going to say, I thought it was just weight. But essentially what this is saying is, since I give a value of 1 for this, that's going to be the column that is going to take up if there's any additional space. Now, we also kind of made sure that happened by giving a row span of 3. And I think we also said that would happen by saying a stretch columns of 1, 2, and 3. So these are different mechanisms that you can use to make sure that um, things match up the size of their parent. That is, uh, and we'll get an exact um, explanation of it. The column width can be shrunk to fit the table. If it's marked as stretchable, it can expand any width to fill extra space. So, in a nutshell, this looks to me like uh, the case of wearing a belt and wearing suspenders at the same time, right? Because these three things, Android layout weight, Android layout span, and stretch columns one, two, three, are different ways of saying, hey, these are the guys that can expand to fill out the extra space, all right? I would guess, but, but sort of the idea and probably the reason that they're all there is we can force the issue. For example, Android layout, instead of letting it decide which one of these two columns is to, to stretch, it'll stretch this one across three. But if I didn't have those in there, it could stretch column one, two, or three to fit in. And probably would do it evenly, would be my guess. All right. So all those, all those, those three things relate to making sure that the table row fits inside the container, takes up all the space that the parent has. I do have to say, I do not claim to be an expert about um, Android screen design. That's something that I definitely can seek out resources for and to talk about more in class. All right. Um, and it's something also that, that can, you know, that can take some practice. Now, one thing I noticed I demonstrated to my two, uh, not 216, 243 class today, where we took a very rudimentary web page, and with just a little bit of styling, you can take a very basic, simplistic web page and make it look much more professional. So, This isn't a design class per se. This is a programming class. That being said, we know, of course, that the design of things is important. All right? It's important in terms of, of course, we want it to look good, but it's important because it adds functionality to it as well. Something that's well designed is easy for the person to use, easy to read, easy to navigate through, and so on. So, as you're doing this, you don't necessarily need to be obsessed with making the most loveliest Android layouts in the world, but do pay a little bit of attention of it. And that will be something in the subsequent weeks that I will put on the agenda to include more uh, design examples of layouts and maybe analyze some of those uh, things. I don't know if I covered all of these. But 
we're sort of out of time, and I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about the one lab that's coming up, Lab 5. So I'm going to bring up that and bring up the Java classes, and we'll spend a minute talking about that. One thing I hope to do is um, make it clear like how the examples that we go over in class relate to the homework assignments. So this is an example where we can see some of the elements that we had in all the examples are going to be manifested in this assignment. Here's the pizza classes. These are what you're going to use for this lab. Indeed I do. Wow. All right. Our pizza shop has Three sizes, small, medium, and large. And it has one choice of topping. You can get pepperoni or you cannot get pepperoni. That's all your choices. And then there's a button to add the pizza to the order. Your UI should have a scrollable list to show all the pizzas that were ordered and should show the cost of the order and how long it will take to bake it. All right? Now... The good news is, is the problem domain logic, the business logic, is already written in these pizza classes, and we'll take a look at it. Let's look at those classes. And let's look at And again, we just need the order Java and pizza Java. Our UI is going to look like this. And we can almost identify where we've seen stuff like this before. All right? We are going to have a spinner control. Or radio buttons or whatever. They'll be the size of the pizza. We will have a checkbox for pepperoni, yes or no. And we'll have a button that will add to the order. All right. We'll then have a scrollable area down here. We're going to add all the pizzas that were ordered. We're going to have a text box that shows the, the cost of the order and a text box or a text edit or a, um, text view to show the time of the order. So the key behavior is what happens when they press this button. All right. Now this gets back to your question you asked before. Could a button do a couple different things? And it absolutely can. What we don't want the button to do, how do I want to put this? We want the button to do all UI kind of things, though. We don't want the button doing pizza logic kind of things. All right. So let's look at what's going to happen. When we create this, we're going to create an order object called O. All right. And that will be our order object throughout the whole app. Right. 
We want a order object throughout the whole app because we want to add to that each iteration through. So when they press the button, what are we going to do? Let's, first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new pizza. I'm going to write the comments. Create a new pizza. We're going to point to the UI elements that contain the size and whether or not there's pepperoni. We are going to set the attributes of our pizza object. We are going to add the pizza to the order. Thank you. Create the new pizza, point to the UI elements, set the attributes of the pizza object, add the pizza to the order, ask the order what the cost of the order is, and ask it what the bake time is. Then finally we're going to add text to the scrollable for the new pizza. All right. So let's look at this one at a time and see where we've seen this before. Creating a new object. Where have we cre seen creating a new object? Well, in the dice game. Right? In the dice game, we create a new object by saying class name object equals new class. Point to UI element. How do we do that? Well, we've been doing that since virtually the first or second example that we went over, where we say get view by ID and we give the name of the ID. So we'll use that to grab the value of the spinner. We'll use that to grab the value of the checkbox. We'll use that to grab the text box and so on and so forth. Set attributes of the pizza object. Well, our pizza object has a set pepperoni method and a set size method. So we can use those methods to assign the proper value to the pizza of the size and whether it has pepperoni or not. Add pizza to the order. In the order class, there's a method that says add to order. We simply call that method and give it the pizza object that we just created. All right. We ask the order what the cost and the time is for the order. There's a method on the order that says calculate cost. All right. There's a method on the order that says calc baking time. The nice thing is, is since I've created these objects and you're simply using these objects, you don't have to know how orders are priced. You don't have to know how it comes up with how long it takes to bake a pizza. You just call those methods. And so, once you create an object, how do you call the method to like calc bake time? It would be the name of your object, O dot calc baking time. And you put that in a text field. Finally, the last step here is I'm going to want to put text to the scrollable for the new pizza. Well, that's simply a simplified version of what we're going to do or what we've done in the favorite Twitter searches, right? We're not creating buttons or anything like that. We're simply creating 
a text view. We're going to have to inflate that text view. We're going to have to set its text property to say something like large, plain, large with pepperoni. All right. And then we're going to add that to the table that's part of the scroll view, just like we did in the, in the favorite uh, Twitter search. All right. So, this assignment is about creating the GUI. It's about reviewing the stuff that we've done before, that is, displaying the GUI, getting pointers to different things. All right? Creating an on-click event or an on-click handler for our button. Then the two sort of new things, if you will, are we're writing code to use an object. All right? I'm using the objects that I've given you. All right? And then the other thing is because we're putting the table row inside the scrollable, then we're adding that to the scrollable uh, field so that we can have a dynamic GUI. Questions about this? All right. Uh, the remainder of time today for the rest of for your lab time, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have about your labs or anything else. Yes. Sure.